the session of the Wikipedia, the law and the real world. Uh, we will have three lectures. The first one, we will hear Tiffany, Tiffany Smith. She is from the U US Department of State Office of E-Diplomacy. She will present the other presenters. And uh, from the US Embassy, Tel Aviv. Uh, Tiffany and her uh, co-presenters will be talking about collaborative di diplomacy. And after the, each lecture, we will have five minutes for uh, Q&A, okay? So, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, I'm Tiffany Smith from the U.S. Department of State's Office of E-Diplomacy, and with me are Hillary Olson Windecker, who's the Public Affairs Counselor at U.S. Embassy Tel Aviv, and Kendall Church, who's the lead developer for Diplopedia. And they'll both be speaking a little bit later, but I'm going to start us off with some broader context and why we're so excited to be here. Um, and thank you so much to um, Wikimedia Israel. It's been an amazing experience thus far. So. Um, Broadly, um, President Obama's Open Government Initiative encourages all U.S. federal agencies to be transparent, participatory, and collaborative. So that can come out in a lot of ways. There's a project called data.gov that's been very popular in the U.S. Um, where different agencies will supply statistical data to the public in a way that then can be translated into machine-readable form. Um, a lot of these things have fed into interesting wiki projects um, as well. Other projects like the Wikipedians in Residence at the National Archives in Smithsonian are also sort of representative of the interest in being more participatory broadly. So um, 21st Century Statecraft um, is an, an initiative of Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, and what she said was, we find ourselves living at a moment in human history when we have the potential to engage in these new and innovative forms of diplomacy and to also use them to help individuals be empowered for their own development. It complements traditional foreign policy tools with newly innovated and adopted instruments of statecraft that fully leverage the networks, technologies, and demographics of our interconnected world. And I think in a lot of ways, Wikipedia represents this. <coughs> it's also 21st century statecraft is going beyond government to government, traditional diplomacy, to interact with citizens both in the US and overseas. So within that overarching policy context, the Office of E-Diplomacy was founded first as a task force in 2002 to enhance the department's ability to share information and collaborate effectively, both within ourselves and at our 200, more than 260 posts overseas and 35 domestic um, bureaus and offices, and also with our external partners. So, we, the Office of E-Diplomacy covers a wide range of things. Um, we're just going to talk about a few of those today. So if you'll just take a moment to read this, I think it's instructive. This piece appeared in the Christian Science Monitor on September 18th, 1912. The reference directive that diplomats must learn to use typewriters represents an early effort by the department to establish a standard for technology use and train officers in the skills necessary to use that technology. Connection technologies, though, are developed and used much more quickly than typewriters are. So we have to be agile and flexible in designing programs that facilitate engagement. Coming up on 100 years since typewriters, pretty excited. Um, so, Two things I'm going to talk about quickly are um, two examples of programs that the Office of E-Diplomacy supports in partnership with the Secretary's Advisor for Innovation. Um, and they are Virtual Student Foreign Service and TechCamp. And Virtual Student Foreign Service, it harnesses the energy of a rising generation of citizen diplomats. And it, what it does is it pairs American college and university students with posts overseas in e-internships. What this is, um, is really exciting. It means that um, students don't necessarily have to pack their bags and, and show up at an embassy to do work. They can do it from their dorms. 
um, from their homes for single moms who um, have kids and they're also in school, they can still get the experience of understanding foreign affairs um, largely and contributing substantively to it. This year, we received over 1,400 applications for just over 100 positions. Tech camps are one of the operational platforms of Secretary Clinton's Civil Society 2.0 initiative. They bring together civil society leaders and technologists to identify social problems in local communities and technologies that can help solve them. Tech camps are unique in that after the event in, in, is over and problems have been identified, civil society organizations are connected to global networks of technologists, sponsors, and digital volunteers interested in helping to implement solutions. And there's a wiki associated with Tech Camp. You can go see it at techcampglobal.org. One thing we're doing internally to help support this engagement is Diplopedia. And Kendall is going to talk about Diplopedia. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Excellent. OK. Uh, I'm Kendall Church. I am uh, the lead developer for Diplopedia. Um, I just started working for the Department of State about a year and three months ago. Um, so prior to coming to the department, I had no experience with MediaWiki at all. Um, and so one of the great things about using MediaWiki as our platform as opposed to other things such as Microsoft um, is that it's very lightweight. It's uh, easy to use, at least for someone like me who was brand new. Um, and also, it just kept costs down for us. So rather than using SharePoint and paying yet another license, we decided to go with something a little bit um, less costly. So um, anyway, um, one of the great parts about Diplopedia is that obviously everyone can contribute to it. Um, and it seems to be a pretty common um, sort of misnomer around the State Department that you have to have permission to edit Diplopedia. A lot of people email us saying, hey, this article is wrong. Can you fix it for me? And so one of the things that we ended up doing was, and you can't see it on here because it's a pretty new feature, is that we ended up putting a link saying, hey, you know, if there's something wrong, don't email us immediately. Try to fix it yourself. Create an account. Because rather than having people try to expect other people to do things for them, you're not really teaching them how to collaborate and share on their own. Um, and so uh, I forgot to mention that Diplopedia is behind our firewall. So you can't go online and see all this awesome stuff that we can see. Um, so it's basically, um, it's, uh, sorry. <laughs> It's one of those great things that you can have it behind their firewall. It's accessible only to state employees. So that way, we're able to collaborate, communicate, sort of sensitive documentation, but also um, keep it as an open communication source. So rather than having documents set on SharePoint with very strict permissions, hard to find, hard to search, it's a lot easier to edit things and be like, OK, this is incorrect. Fix it. And that way, everyone else will know. Um, so basically you know, your definition of a, of a successful wiki. Um, is there anything else that I'm forgetting? Oh, that's right. We have another slide. Um, so anyway, recently we actually um, asked, or we, um, we added the, uh, what's it called, contribution scores uh, extension. And it's actually been very popular because we found that traditionally, I guess there's a sort of, um, what's it called? Um, I don't know, statistically speaking, that there's a certain percentage of people that will be much more likely to edit something or higher percentage of editors versus like over the total number of people that are editors. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so basically we have one person that edits a lot, another person that edits maybe two or three articles, sort of consistent with the sort of um, uh, statistics of <coughs> Wikipedia, correct? Okay. So anyway, so when did we start? Five years ago? 2006. Yeah, 2006 is when we started um, Diplopedia. It took a while to take off. I obviously wasn't there, so I don't know personally, but this is from what I've heard. Um, first couple years were pretty slow, and then it really started to ramp up. Um, when did it, like what, three years ago? OK. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we founded Diplopedia in September of 2006, and we worked really hard to make sure that people were comfortable with using it. Um, and so you see sort of an iterative path um, up. It doesn't look like the, the nice J-curve and dramatic increases that you see on Wikipedia. 
And it's something where we're still inviting lots and lots of contributions today. And one of the things we learned from the contribution scores extension was this um, ability to figure out who's really in our top 5% of paragons of altruism. Thank you. Um, and then who are the other people who are really contributing in small ways, but in ways that they're the only people that have access to that information. And how can we identify them and help foster them in the future? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty much it. Um, Is there anything else? No, I think okay. that's, that's it. Yeah. We can't really tell we'll you take questions much. about Diplopedia yeah. a little bit later on. We can't tell you too much about it just because it's, you know, <laughs> secret dive and everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We, I mean, ask anything you want. We're just obviously not going to share um, anything that's considered sensitive information. So broadly, Diplopedia has been very successful. Yes. We are proud of it, and we're looking forward to, to finding ways to um, help foster the engagement through Diplopedia that Hillary would talk about at Embassy Tel Aviv. And now I don't need an extra microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too short to stand behind a uh, podium. Bokatov, my name is Hillary. I'm the public affairs officer at Embassy Tel Aviv. Um, I'm sort of a, a fraud being here at this conference because I don't really know anything about um, Wikipedia. And I had an intern in my office just a couple months ago, and so I said, you know, tell me something about it. So we actually have a draft of a Wikipedia page that will go live on Monday about Embassy um, Tel Aviv. So I hope that you will all do what you do. Look at it and comment on it. I'm not exactly sure what, so I'm new to this. So please, come on to our page. Um, Tiffany was explaining uh, 21st century statecraft. Actually, the, the, the picture is a little bit broader. Um, traditionally, there had been two different agencies, the State Department and the U.S. Information Agency. And our jobs were different. The State Department was this government-to-government -government relationship, and the job of the U.S. Information Agency was to talk to people, people to people. And this is, we had exchanges, all of the U.S. government uh, um, cultural programs and educational exchanges, such as Fulbright. Have you, anybody? Okay, so Fulbright cultural exchanges, anything having to do with the people of a country has always been an important part of, of diplomacy. But it was only in 1999 that our agency uh, was merged into the State Department. So sometimes they still kind of forget that you know, we're, we're part of that. Uh, and so they think that this is, is new to want to talk to the people of a country. So I had to just reinforce that it's not. But our tools are different. And the tools make it a lot um, easier in a way, but things that we're still struggling with. And I hope that in our discussion session, uh, I actually have some questions that I hope you can help me with. So this is the embassy um, website, the official website. The websites started, I'm not exactly sure, I seem to remember sometime in the 90s maybe, um, when people started putting up official websites. Thank you. Um, and it, it has a template because they wanted all the embassies to look sort of the same. So uh, unfortunately, it is, um, you know, as any official website, it's used for uh, giving information out mostly. And people um, use the embassy website. We, we put a lot of information on it. We've got you know, pictures and videos and links to our social media, but what we still have, we find that people like to come here to find out about um, visa issues more than anything else. But that's okay. They have to go to the front page. Let's see, how do I get to the next one? Okay. Now, starting in December, we made a Facebook page. And in fact, now we have three of them. So one is a consular only. And that's this one over here. So this is entirely run by the consular section. And you'll find things on there like questions you can ask the consul. And it's all consular related. It, and they started before the embassy did. And in December, we started the Facebook one there. That's the embassy Facebook page. Now, the idea is to try to see how we can interface with the public, where the website is only one-way communication. I'd say we're only partially successful. 
We have gotten over 3,000 fans since we started in December. That's not a bad amount of growth. But we're not having, I don't think we're actively using it properly yet. We're still more sending out um, comments and hoping that people will respond. Um, we, just this week, we've had a film director here, Deborah Granick, and so one of the ways that we've used the website is to both advertise things that are publicly available, so that in this case we had um, discussion with Deborah Granick, and you could see her film, Winter Bones, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and tonight in Halon. So we're using it to invite people to come to events, and we also are using it to try to elicit uh, feedback. In this case, we said, are you a, an Israeli incipient filmmaker? Would you like to talk to her? And so we had people write in if they had an idea for a film, and then we chose one who was having coffee with her today and can pitch their film. And then the top one just opened last Friday. We have a new ambassador, and he wanted to have his own Facebook page. So that's a brand new one. Um, and then the last thing that we have social media wise is a YouTube channel. So we have about 150 little YouTube um, videos up there. So anything from uh, this past Wednesday, the ambassador went and gave his uh, credentials to President Perez. So we put up a little video on that. And this one was from, I guess the 4th of July party. Okay, and we have different events around the country, and so we try to put videos up there. Again, in order to share with people who did not participate in the event. Now, my, my question for you really is, we are divided in our office between the press function, which traditionally um, sends information out. Now here, social media is great, because we can bypass the the standard media, and I guess that's sort of the whole point of it, is that we don't have to wait for Haaretz or you know, Jerusalem Post to want to interview somebody and talk about an event. So we can put it out ourselves and hope that people will find it. But in the cultural section of our operation, we have a lot of subject specialists who go around the country meeting civil society, different organizations, schools, universities. We give lots of grants to different organizations that are trying to do things like um, connect Jewish and Arab high schools so they can have some communication. We fund summer camps, um, all kinds of different things, you know, hundreds, hundreds of things a year. And we have lots of exchange programs. Besides the Fulbright, we have short-term exchanges. Now, what I think that we're not doing, I know we're not doing it successfully yet, is how to keep engaging the people after they have finished. We know how to do this like with live communication, but to actually harness social media to try to utilize the capability in order to continue the contact between groups of people that have maybe met for a week or a month or maybe kids that are, that we've got 2,000 students studying English around the country, okay? So to continue their relationship with each other utilizing the social media, we're not doing that now, and I'm sure that there are ways that we can, and, and you've got ideas for me. So can I open it up and ask you if you've got some ideas there? How do we actually encourage this interaction to continue? Thank you. What? Actually, um, and before we get to that, <laughs> um, we do want to hear from you. Um, we actually, we're so excited to come to the conference. The State Department has for a long time been happily participating in Wikimania, actually since 2006 in Boston when we first sort of introduced the idea of Diplopedia to Wikimania and got a, a fairly warm, receptive response, which it turned out was prescient and accurate, so thank you. Um, but these are sort of the questions that we think about when we come here in terms of where are there more opportunities and we've learned a lot in the past few days about that as well as how can we support the sharing of information across cultures and then why should 21st century statecraft matter to Wikipedians. So if you have any thoughts on those questions too, we'd hope to, to invite those and, and be able to respond to any questions you have. And 
There we are, Q&A. <laughs> okay. Um, hi. My question is, and I think this sort of by clarifying this, well, this is loud. Um, I think that, no, I, my, my question is that, uh, and I think this answer will help us all, I guess, answer the questions you have better, is what are your expectations from engaging people, anyone, as the State Department through social media? Is it that people should chit chat and post videos on your wall? Because I think that people don't really look at the State Department or embassy site as where they're going to freely write and say whatever they think and so on. So my question, uh, 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 well, exactly. So I'm saying like people have many other places for these things. So my question is what is it that your expectations are of people in this regard? And then I guess based on that we can know if there is even a place to be disappointed or feel there's a lack of engagement. conversations with us and with each other because that's something that that we've seen certainly that people in different parts of the country have uh, often very few opportunities to meet other groups and so a lot of our um, a lot of our work involves getting people together in like kids in summer camps who maybe live in neighborhoods and they haven't met uh, people from other neighborhoods or people in mixed cities being able to do things together in sort of a safe environment. Does it have to be done on the state site? Pardon? Does it have to be done on the embassy or state department sites, or you can create new ones for it? Well, what I'm thinking of one way uh, is I've, I've heard that there are kind of closed groups that one can facilitate, and that that might be a safer way to do it. So that, let's say there's two high school classes that have participated in a book club and that we've, we've financed this in order to help, you know, we've paid for the teacher and we've paid for the materials. And then in English, two different high schools are able to meet periodically and talk about English literature, sort of a safe, neutral topic. So because especially we're talking about the high school level, I heard that there are ways to kind of make closed groups. So maybe it's a little bit safer to think about a closed group where they can continue to talk to each other and get to know each other, and it doesn't necessarily have to involve us, but it, it is a, a, a safer place for them to get to continue to have conversations with people that they are not otherwise getting to know. I mean, even in, in the Bedouin area, just by the way, we had one um, activity that was just allowing boys and girls to talk to each other with a facilitated counselor. Because even though they go to mixed schools, um, they didn't really communicate. So this was a, a gender. We were trying to uh, facilitate gender awareness that, you know, that, that boys and girls have things that they can talk about to each other. So that's, that's something that we facilitated down in one of the villages. Hi, I have a question about the um, Diplopedia page. Actually, several questions. First is, can you tell me uh, something about the current scope? What kind of content goes into it? Um, secondly, does this scope overlap with um, other informational sources within the State Department? How do you deal with the, um, um, let's say, um, the, the, the overlap problems that come with it um, and, and maybe the consistency problems. Um, third question is, um, how do people from the State Department find out about content on Diplopedia? Do they have to go to Diplopedia in order to find something or um, are there information technology um, means to, to, to stump them towards Diplopedia content whenever they look for it? Um, and the last thing is, do you monitor um, your user satisfaction about the content there? Because I, I only hear instances from State Department employees who are not working on Diplopedia but are simply um, potential users and they don't seem to be um, that much happy about having another source of potential information uh, which, have to, which they have to go through in order to find things that, that might be relevant to their work. That's a lot of questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'll try to cover everything. Um, 
And Kendall, if you want to come up too to, to contribute, that'd be great. Um, so in terms of, of access, um, the um, Diplopedia is integrated with our enterprise search engine. Um, and so that's fairly easy. It's, it's sort of the way that um, search on the internet can, you can easily find Wikipedia articles. Um, and we've actually used that to teach people how those things are similar. Um, in terms of scope, um, it's fairly broad. Um, it's on the, um, let me think how to explain. Primarily, information on Diplopedia is about administrative processes and ways to get people up to speed on information more quickly than they might if they have to go through the Code of Federal Regulations and the Foreign Affairs Manual, which can be sort of a longer and tedious process. So generally, it points to those things in a natural language sort of way. Um, an example might be language incentives. Um, there are different things if you have special skills that you'll actually get um, sort of a higher salary for different things in the department. And it's really kind of tricky to find exactly which thing applies to which thing and so on and so forth. So one way that Diplopedia can help is sort of say, okay, so if people do a search for language incentive, here's just the broad swath of everything that applies, the same way that Wikipedia works for those sorts of things. And then you might have pointers to the official references. Um, there are ways in which Diplopedia is similar to Wikipedia. There are other ways in which it is very different. Um, one way is actually that in the State Department we refer to um, you know, an embassy as the city where it is. So, you know, um, the Paris page is going to be about the operation of U.S. Embassy Paris. It's not going to be about Paris and how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is to go to Paris. Um, so um, there are places where Diplopedia doesn't overlap at all with Wikipedia, even though people might think intuitively that it would. Um, in terms of that, the user access and things like that and questions about where, um, whether or not it's a, an addition to other sorts of information, um, broadly, what we try to do is, is mainly point, um, is sort of, you know, have these articles that are available, help people to contribute, and then make it sort of like the, the metadata for other substantive information as well. Um, so with 14,000 articles, it's a pretty big swath at this point, but we're also um, actually doing a push this um, summer to find other ways to where are places that are still uncovered, um, and how can we encourage more contributions from other sorts of groups. Um, Broadly, um, we've actually found that women have been very active contributors to Diplopedia over the life of the, the system, and, and that's something that's just sort of interesting to me in terms of the ways that people approach Wikipedia vice Diplopedia. I think that got it. I think we have a couple more questions that we can take. Is there, is there any overlap with the World Factbook, or do you import anything from Wikipedia? We, do, we have actually, we've developed little templates that link to Wikipedia articles and link to the World Factbook, but we don't necessarily copy and paste, because why would you? I mean, there's great information that's constantly available from other sources. Uh, as Wikipedians, we actually won private wikis ourselves for administrative type things. And so we know the challenge of getting people to come there and like do the regular work and then come to the wiki. Um, but I was curious about something. Do you have um, talk pages of, that you utilize for discussion about content as it's written? And also, do people kind of take ownership at a certain level of the pages? And so like if something gets changed, are they emailed? If people have questions, you know, how interactive is it? Yeah, the watch feature is probably the thing that we, you know, after sort of the first year of teaching everybody how this exists, watch is something that everyone loves. <laughs> In that, you know, there's information where it might be either political section of an embassy that really sort of owns that content, but they want to make sure it's available, so they use the the sort of watch feature the same way that anyone does um, on Wikipedia, and it's and then get an email if things change. Generally, what we found, though, is that you know we don't have edit wars on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> since um, you can't be an anonymous user, we don't really have trolls if you're only on you know the Department of State sort of network. <laughs> um, so um, it's a little bit you know they, they, they approach it with diplomacy, um, and um, so the um, the talk features are used, but primarily just sort of as a heads up. Maybe someone wants to take a look at this; it's starting to look out of date, kind of thing as opposed to talking more substantively about the content, because broadly it's sort of, people can kind of generally agree in a way on most of the content for us. Do you use liquid 
don't use liquid threads. Uh, <laughs> and um, we've actually talked about it. There are a lot of different um, projects that we use internally and um, for collaboration. Um, so liquid threads for us wasn't as, as critical an extension, although we're actually, Kendall has a mental list of all the extensions she's planning to add after um, she gets home. <laughs> okay, we have just one last question. Um, I wanted to ask if uh, the system is referred to as a wiki or more as a content management system. And uh, also if you see that when people are using the Diplopedia, uh, they also start to use Wikipedia more and edit. And That's a great question. Um, and it's very thoughtful and interesting. Um, we do call it a wiki. Um, and we have called it a wiki since 2006. Um, the, there, you know, it is a wiki. Anyone can edit any page they want. Um, and the point of it as a content management system is also apt in that there are some very, very small embassies we have around the world where they don't have an IT person. Um, so they'll actually use it sort of as a content management system to make sure that their information is available to others. Um, and the other part of your question, sorry, t tell me the second question again. Uh, with people that use Diplopedia, oh, also if they convert, yes. <laughs> That's a great question. So are Diplopedians Wikipedians? Absolutely. Um, we've had a lot of people um, that will start with Diplopedia because it's kind of, you know, the safe space. They're not too worried about using it. Um, and they get sort of a general sense. Not all of our policies are the same as the policies on Wikipedia, so they might get a little intimidated by some things, but we do abide by neutral point of view, so they're familiar with that by the time they get in. Um, but um, yeah, there are actually a number of, of folks that um, once they get comfortable with um, editing, they'll they'll sort of say, oh, you know what? I bet I can contribute something to you know this Wikipedia article and a place I've lived or something I've done or stuff I do in my spare time too. So absolutely, and we're happy to help support that too. I think that's it for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll be around for the rest of the day. Okay, our next speaker is Derek Chen. He will, he's from uh, Wikimedia uh, Hong Kong, and he will talk about Wikipedia is afraid of governments. Okay, um, yeah, I'm scared with so many distinguished speakers down here. I'm actually scared. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, and they're from the government. A lot, of, a lot of people say that if you start work and finish work, it doesn't matter what you do in between. So I'm actually pretty happy that I've got Tiffany Smith preceding me and Kat Walsh after me. Anyway, a bit about myself. Um, I'm Derek Chan. I, was, uh, I grew up in Hong Kong and now I'm studying in England. I'm, I'm a volunteer for both the Hong Kong chapter and the UK chapter. Um, and with my kind of due residence, um, I've kind of seen the worst of all kinds of governments. So I'm really glad we're speaking on this topic. Anyway, what this about is completely the opposite to what um, Tiffany and, and Kendra were speaking. Um, they said about what governments use behind the, their scenes, um, Media Wiki, whereas Kat Walsh will later speak about how the interplay between Wikipedia and, and um, the legal courts. What I'm going to speak is that is about how Wikipedians voluntarily convert, um, convert or confirm, no, um, conform to government standards when there is something better to do. And that's why I say more accurately, English Wikipedia naming conventions are obliged to local governments. So what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk a bit about the problem that I've served, which is a, a great gap between what is written in the policy and what I observe is the current practice. And I'll give a few examples, I'll give a summary, and then I'll, I'll address a caveat which is about what I've observed and then revise my summary, and then propose a few solutions and ask for your opinions. Okay, does anyone recognize this? 
Okay, yeah, Jerry recognizes this. If you've been to Wikimania last year, you'll probably recognize this one. Okay, where is that? Um, this is the ruins of the place where the first bullets of the Second World War were fired in Danzig or Gdansk, Poland. Um, wars, they're devastating. Um, people are killed, buildings are damaged. So are edit wars. <laughs> okay, wars happen because there is one place. Oh, sorry. Um, Every place can only have one kind of um, governmental owner at any one given time. So are Wikipedia articles. Um, at any point in time, a Wikipedia article can only have one page name. And so, and so um, if there is a place where there are multiple or disputed names, people edit war on them. And in the case of Gdansk or Danzig, in 2005, for March 2005, a vote decided that this article should be called Gdansk, not Danzig. But then the problem goes farther. It's not only that. Next. No, it's not happening. What happened? Okay. Okay. Um, the written policy says, um, in neutral point of view, for those of you who are, who are un initiated, Neutral point of view means that Wikipedia should not endorse a particular point of view. Instead, it should um, reflect the, all, the major, all the major point of views about a particular subject. But then, um, in the case of an article title, you can't really give any, a, any balance because there's only one, one thing that can be on the title. And it actually says, while neutral terms are generally preferable, this must be balanced against clarity. What does that mean? Ignore neutrality if necessary. <laughs> okay, so we're going to the next policy about actually naming articles. It says in Wikipedia fonts, when a widely accepted English name in a modern context exists for a place, we should use it. Sorry, excuse me. We should use it. But then what I observe is that, no, this is not the best summary of what I, what I see. I think a better summary is that it's all about the government. <laughs> okay, stay in Poland. There's an article called Wojewodships in Poland. Um, it's, in Polish is, forgive my bad Polish, it's something like Wojewodstwo. Um, it's obviously an English word invented by Polish government so that they can describe Polish administrative divisions. And even the official translation guide recommends the word province. Then why are we calling this article Wojewodships of Poland? This has been raised in the last Wikimania. There's a problem that remains unsolved. Why is it like that? <laughs> Next. Okay, um, this one is one of the very minor things, or major things, as I might think, um, I'm, I, that I don't agree with Wikipedia. There's a, a place um, somewhere halfway between um, southern Japan and Taiwan, and it's a, a group of very disputed islands between um, China and Japan. Um, it's a disputed territory, it's historical Chinese, and um, currently under Japanese military control. And um, there are boats running around um, um, bringing conflicts in the actual, around the actual islands. And there are also frequent edits and move walls on the article. And the article is currently full protected. OK. Go back a bit. Um, actually, when the British Empire colonized Hong Kong, they coined a term called Pinnacle Islands, which is completely neutral because it captures the meaning of the, of the na name of the islands. In, in English. Therefore, it should be a neutral name that we should be able to compromise into. But then, the article itself is called Senkaku Islands. Why? Why? You see, it's gold locked. Like, you see the gold padlock up there? It's so editable that they just decided to lock it and not, not let anyone edit the article. What that tells us is that, the, and the only obvious reason that this article is actually called Senkaku rather than Pinnacle or Tai in the Chinese name, is that the Japanese government currently controls the territory. So I remember that someone actually used in a top page that as a, as a major rationale why we should call this article Senkaku over any of the other names. But what it tells us, what this tells us is that government names are endorsed in disregard for neutrality. Next example. Um, Prasapti over here. 
um, this uh, UNESCO World Heritage. Wikipedia is run for World Heritage, if you don't know yet. Yay. Um, it's a disputed territory, and it's a UNESCO Heritage Site. Um, it's nominally Cambodian, but actually there are some military conflicts, and um, both, both countries stationed massive amounts of troops around, uh, around the temple area. And I think the only obvious reason that um, Priya Vihar, rather than Pravihan, was endorsed is that the UN listing adopts Priya Vihar in official listings. What that tells us is that, like, yeah, it's always about a government, whether it's like a, a local one or a super supranational one. It's the government viewpoint that's endorsed. Next, the um, the city where Jerry, uh, my co-presenter in the other presentation, ha um, was born. Um, if you know about a place Canton or the language Cantonese which we speak, um, it is the literal. Um, phonetic transcription of um, the name Guangdong, which is the local place, place name in Cantonese. And um, the name Canton is losing popularity since, um, since um, the communists have become the Chinese government in 1949, but it's still in use. I, I remember in 1999 when I went to um, the Melbourne airport and the departure board says Canton, not Guangzhou. But what that shows is that Wikipedia seems to endorse a government usage of a place name over a local usage. One more. This is the crowning gem of our entire presentation, Cote d'Ivoire Ivory Coast. Okay, their government has been in the past about 10 years, been insisting very strongly that everyone should translate the name phonetically, not literally, because it's obvious what the name means. But the point is, both BBC and CNN exclusively use the name Ivory, Co Ivory Coast for the place. What does that mean? And Wikipedia is serious to the name Cote d'Ivoire rather than Ivory Coast. Clearly, we aren't using an English name that is in common circulation. This is completely in disregard for common usage in English over, uh, in order to prefer a government version. <coughs> okay, so what do we observe? Article names seem to always follow the name used by the governmental regime of the place, and this is done often in, regard for, in disregard for neutrality and English common usage if necessary. Okay, and then you say, no, no, um, Germany is called Germany, and Cologne is called Cologne, Rome is not called Roma. Why? There's a caveat called use English. This seems completely ridiculous. Like, on the English Wikipedia, there's a policy called use English. What it actually says is that, like, it's the same sentence. When a widely accepted English name in a modern context exists for a place, we should use it. And therefore, we say Cologne, not Cone. We say, or, or Color. Uh, we say Rome, not Roma, and, and so on. But then, I think this is a correct observation, but the, the explanation given is wrong. When you go to governments of those places, the governments of, of these places use the English form of the name in their official English communication. For example, if you go to the, um, the official homepage of the German Bundestag, they call the country the Federal Republic of Germany, not Bundesrepublik Deutschland. And hence, it's because the government endorses this English name that they, it, it's used here. And so we revise our observation a bit. Articles, article names, thank you, always follow the official English name used by a governmental regime of the place in this regard for neutrality and English common usage if necessary. Okay, that's my observation. Okay, have we got some solutions? Let's go and mass edit articles. <laughs> okay, um, actually I, I'm, I'm quite for the idea of like looking at policy and go, going to edit articles, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man I, I, like, and I lose my temper quite easily. <laughs> Enough people have been banned by the Arbcon for behavioral issues while enforcing policies. They are completely doing the right thing, but because their mood is not, not right, their attitude is not right, they get banned. I, I'm sorry if anyone from the Arbcon gets, gets um, infuriated by this. I'm sorry. Um, okay, the other solution. Change the policies because Wikipedia policies evolved as um, in, the, in the last two days many other speakers have said. Um, is um, they're descriptive. They're meant to be guides for newbies and to teach them how to use Wikipedia and how to edit it. So we really should change the guidelines. But that's a painful process. You, you need to change the guideline, which is contentious. 
you need an RFC and, and like voting and, and like months of effort before you can even change one word in, in, in the thing. And hereby, as someone who has now seen this observation that in terms of article names about um, places, um, I think you now know the observation and I, I implore you to help me to go and help me change the actual policy if you, if you think that's the right thing to do. Or in terms in a technical sphere, there may be another solution. Since, um, as you can see, these two articles are basically the same article, but um, from the way, the, from a number of words in the article title, you can see they're two different names. These two articles are automatically converted, and there is something implemented in the Chinese Wikipedia since like the early days of the Chinese Wikipedia. This is called automatic character conversion, and um, it helps because um, from then on. In the Chinese Wikipedia, you don't need separate editions for traditional and, and um, simplified Chinese. So you can just write in either form of, of um, characters and the, the machine will convert it for you. But what it also does is that it does automatic dialect conversion. So if you're viewing from Hong Kong and you choose Hong Kong as your um, skin preference, then it will convert all the words into the Hong Kong form, which is on the left. Whereas if you come from mainland China, it converts the words and converts phrases into a mainland form, which is on the right. And so the number of words are different because there are different phrases used in different parts of the Chinese speaking world to refer to the same thing. Can we deploy that on the English Wikipedia? For example, if you're reading from within Poland, we geotag you and give you Gdansk. If you're reading from Germany, we geotag you and give you Danzig. <laughs> okay, although the point is, this is something the English Wikipedia has tried for a decade to avoid, which is dialect conversion. Because like, over the last 10 years, we, we, we've really tried to let articles stay in American, British, New Zealand, Australian, whatever type of English that, that people want to write in, and don't convert them. So this might open up a whole new can of worms. So a bit of summary. OK, wars are damaging, and hence we need dispute resolution. And the spirit resolution comes from consensus. But then the consensus seems to say, say that when people discuss, they say we want community, commonly accepted, neutral names. Whereas the actual practice we observe when people don't discuss with each other is that the government endorsed names happen to be endorsed. Changing a rule is costly, but um, ch making a technical allowance seems to be more costly in, in this case. And rules are descriptive, not prescriptive. And everyone has exceptions. So. Um, now I want to open the floor for questions. Just tell me if, if I'm observing complete bollocks, then please tell me. Or, or if you think this is worth doing, then please tell me how, how we can do it. Thank you. about the technical solution. In fact, there are quite a lot of uh, arguments on Wikipedia, and you can have it that the skin will <laughs> identify what's your position on various other discussions, yep. and will show you a wiki page that will make you happy. Or for some people who like to be irritated, it will show you the one that will irritate you so that you'll feel good about fighting. So I think it's a great, opening up a great option for Wikipedia. Style your own. Is, and, An and is Andrew Garrett here? No, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think he's the person to talk to if you want if you want uh, some machine learning and 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 implement that into on Wikipedia. And and about the rule of, of government uh, yes. management, then the question becomes which government? Because many areas are disputed. So you're implying the the current force holding that area, or so. the force legitimately owning that area. Or the force that believe that you should be legitimately. Um, um, my observation is that um, the force that currently owns it, like in in practice, hence hence Senkaku, not Jiaoyutai. Um, Josh. All right. I believe you read the submissions page, and I said I was recently involved in a manual. Of yes, indeed. Over Philippine place names, and I told the other Filipino attendees here, I'm here to lampas the naming policies that they adopted because. But otherwise, I think it's kind of important to reflect that sometimes we do, as we as community, sometimes tend to go against the policies. Um, but I think an important thing that we need to ask is, is there necessarily a threshold by which you should uphold, let's say, the use English policy? For example, there are places in the Philippines which supposedly have valid English names. And 
this is the English name for this province is, let's say, West Mindoro, which is an island south of Manila. In, but in Filipino, we call it Oriental Mindoro or Silangang Mindoro, let's put it, for example. And the question now is, when you have so many of these differing names, which are all in use by government, which name do we end up having to choose? Let's say all of them are in common use. All of them are in use by media, the government, etc. So then, it puts it the question, how do we decide which one do we ought to use? If everyone will just continue to disagree on which one to use. Um, I don't actually know is the answer. Jerry has previously um, given me a few examples um, when I've premiered um, this presentation in Hong Kong. And, um, and basically what we observed in addition is that if the government is inconsistent within itself, we can't actually tell which one will prevail. Um, usually the, the other policies on Wikipedia actually win instead. I'm trying to be nasty, so I'm just giving more conflicting Evidence. That'd be good. Yeah, the first one I would address is a few islands in the South China Sea, because the one is called the Taiping Islands, and who owned by the Republic of China, that is Taiwan, and actually English Wikipedia is calling it Itu Aba Island. Whose name is that? It's probably from uh, I don't know somebody, but it's I don't know <laughs> what the hell is that. That, that, that's, that's... we were kicked out of Itu Aba by the Taiwanese. It was formerly a Filipino island. <laughs> and the second one is called this Sparty Islands. And and it's called the Nansha Island by the by the by the Taiwanese. And then the third one is Patas Island. But who actually controls them? Taiwan. <laughs> okay, I back to Senkaku Islands because Senkaku Island I w w really want to correct you because originally is an English name. And then the Japanese used the Pinnacle Islands to describe back to the Hanja and then to become Senkaku Islands. You so see, you see on, on the discussion page of the English Wikipedia, some people are saying that Senkaku is a translation of, uh, no, Pinnacle is a transla translation of Senkaku and Fishing rather than the other way around. So you should go and talk to them. No, it's in the Wikipedia. <laughs> it's in on the Wikipedia saying that it's a British seller found it and name it Pinnacle Islands, yeah. and then the Japanese use it as a Senkaku Island. So that's the case. And that's thirdly, thirdly is about the Cote d'Ivoire case, yeah. and I should blame the U.S. government because from <laughs> Central Intelligence, you know, from CIA, fact of the world is called Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so it's afraid of government. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I mean, yeah, but like they're afraid of both governments, not, not common usage. Like they've got two governments to rely on, do you see that? And therefore that prevails rather than what is in common usage by the BBC, <coughs> CNN and everyone else in English-speaking world. But actually on the non-English speaking, on the non-English Wikipedia, referring to the example of Cote d'Ivoire, if you look at the Wikileaks, there's a lot of Wikileaks you'll see that a lot of the non-English Wikipedia's um, translate Cote d'Ivoire but uh, not phonetically, but instead they use it on context. So let's say in Indonesian, it's actually called Pantai Gadil, which is literally Ivory Coast. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. We have another question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, first, I want to congratulate you on the choice of venue. <laughs> because evidently, if there is a place on this planet where every piece of land or stone has heavily contested different names with deep political meanings, it's here. So. <laughs> Well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm not completely sure I understood what you propose, but I just wish to point out that uh, for all the faults of the existing system, uh, if we, for example, strive to make the name dependent on how many people think this should be the name, then obviously uh, things are going to get quite problematic where maybe 10 years down the road, maybe 20 or 30 million people who will be Wikipedians from your nation will claim that the word Tibet has no meaning or that the place should be called otherwise. So uh, just as an example, I'm not sure there is any alternative rule which will not cause as many problems as the current one. That's just what I wanted to point out. 
I, I don't actually know what the solution is. I'm just pointing a problem and suggesting a number of solutions which I want you guys to discuss. And it, it's quite possible that the best way to solve it is to not solve it. <laughs> um, in, in which case, I, I need you guys to tell me. Um, who's next? Um, here. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. I think it was pinpointed really good. Uh, my, my question to you is this, because I think out of all of us here, you've actually put the most thoughts. Instead of uh, focusing on your examples, um, it's clear from your conclusion, your case, that some names are not going to be commonly accepted, and there will always be a large amount of numbers disputing these things. And uh, furthermore, that uh, if you allowed majority rule, a large group may still be unhappy government endorsed names aside. So although your skin's example uh, is a very good solution, I think, the problem is that then people might then divide that, like one name into two names, that name into two, and many editors will start focusing on all sorts of niche editing. So, and in that regard, I think there's also possibly no end in sight. So my question is, if you had to choose one name, what do you think should be the best criteria if multiple skins might result in that sort of endless process you described. So what do you think the criteria should be as opposed to what it is now, if we have to keep one name and one editing form? So that's assuming we, we can't do skins. Yeah, okay. you have to keep the one because skins need more skins and more skins and more skins like everyone. Um, um, first of all, I'd like to respond to the more skins thingy. Um, the Chinese Wikipedia is actually doing pretty well even though they've got, I think, um, in, in the article title bit, on top of pretty much every article, there is a list of six names, which, are, which correspond um, to Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China, Taiwan, Malaysia and Singapore, um, 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 traditional Chinese unconverted, and simplified Chinese unconverted. So um, we've got six already, and it's, it works pretty well, and there's no need to, to, be, to worry about that. And so there's no need to worry about skins either. Um, if there's one rule that we need to adopt uh, and we can only adopt one name for any article, I think, as, as what I say, I endorse the perspective that um, Wikipedia policies are descriptive, not prescriptive. And therefore, I, I think, from what I observe, we should say, yeah, the, we should use the name, the English name used by a local government regime. Oh, yeah, yes, I'm wondering whether you think um, biographies of living persons is a good analogy. I mean, what if it seems perfectly reasonable to say a government can decide whoever controls that land gets to name it the way that, you know, Cassius Clay could change his name to Muhammad Ali and it didn't matter whether, you know, majority of America thought he was, you know, converting to a crazy religion or whatever. Why is that not a good analogy to think of, the, of land as, as a body and the government as the mind and that they get to say what they're called? and Everyone else has to deal with it. Um, you'd be glad to know that Wikipedia, on Wikipedia policy, it actually says for biographies of people, um, the name or title in which the person adopts themselves is, will, should prevail. For example, when Kate Middleton got married to Prince William, um, Jimbo Wales himself moved the article to, to Catherine um, um, Prince, um, Duchess of Cambridge. And for example, um, when, when Charlene Woodstock got married to Prince Albert, um, her her, her article got moved straight away to um, Charlene, Princess of Monaco. So, so in, in, in the sense of, um, of people um, and BLPs, this is already being done. The official name is endorsed. But um, what I want to point out is that um, for place names, we have a clearly different policy, but we seem to be observing the same phenomenon. Very good observation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Thank you. Our last speaker for today's session is Kat Walsh. Kat is from the US Wiki Wikimedia, and she will talk about May it please the court. Wikipedia as a reference in the US courts. Kat, good luck.
Thank you for being patient through technical difficulties. <laughs> so this is a place of court, the use of Wikipedia and United States judicial opinions. So, so, uh, welcome. Uh, Wikipedia has been increasingly used as a source in the United States courts as part of the opinions. So, court citations are very visible and influential places. Uh, not only are they <laughs> used for uh, for scholarship, they're part. Right. 
anything else, and I'm just going to start shouting, I think. Uh, influential places, not only are they part of scholarship, uh, they're part of the foundations that society is based on. As such, it's really important to get everything that's in court citations pretty well right. So using Wikipedia in court citations has both benefits and risks. Benefits, because using it where it's used appropriately means that it's really part of public life, it's being used to enrich knowledge, it's being used uh, <coughs> as a, it's being, mm, used to provide support for the opinions that make up society. It has risks because when it's used inappropriately, uh, citing it uh, reflects very badly on, I keep hearing feedback. Uh, Uh, risks because when it's uh, cited where it shouldn't be, uh, Wikipedia takes a hit in public opinion and people will come to trust it less. So public trust in the opinions of the court is supremely important for decisions to be accepted. Uh, the reason our system of laws works is because we accept that it works and we rely on those decisions uh, in order to have uh, further decisions rely on them. So for those of you who are not familiar with US judicial opinions, uh, they were written by judges uh, based on both materials of law submitted by the lawyers and legal principles that came beforehand. They lay out the facts of a case, the applicable laws or legal principles, and then the application of the law to the facts. Frequently, they're very long and detailed, summarizing the arguments presented by each side and why the judge has accepted or re rejected them. They have citations to authority to support their position. Judges write them with the assistance of clerks, Judges are bound by precedent of higher courts within their uh, region, but they may use anything as persuasive evidence, even when they're not required to follow it. Usually this is other case law, but it may be law re review articles, or rarely something else, such as citations to textbooks, or even sources on the web, such as Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a con controversial source in many places because of its unreliability, but it is especially so in the courts where reliability is so important. An incorrect reliance on Wikipedia may result in injustice. Either financial, somebody may take a large financial hit as a result of a court decision that went against them. It may be inequitable. They may re be required to do something they shouldn't have been required to do. Or it may even result in criminal penalty, somebody being uh, penalized by the justice system and put in jail or not put in jail because of something that was said on Wikipedia. The first citation by the courts to Wikipedia is in 2004. There have been over 500 of them since. So this is the first federal opinion that cited Wikipedia. Uh, there are both advantages and disadvantages to doing so. The primary disadvantages is that it may be unreliable. You can't be quite sure that what is said is what is true. It's not authoritative. It is not the definitive source. It's a secondary source that relies on other authoritative sources to, to support its opinions. It's unstable. What is said may change, and the, even the existence of articles may change. One article that has been cited by a court opinion is in fact being proposed for deletion right now as I went to go and look at this article. And it's untrusted. Even if it is correct, even if the judges trust it and the lawyers trust it, those who are relying on this opinion to determine what it is they should do may not accept the opinion. Uh, if they don't trust the decisions, how can they use it to guide their behavior? The reasons to use it, it's up to date. It, it may reflect more current knowledge than other sources which don't update as fast. It's easily accessible. Uh, one thing that's very common to other uh, authorities cited by the law is that often they're not accessible. Federal cases may be, state court cases may be not, textbooks may be not. It provides general explanations. When you need background knowledge uh, on something that is uh, very simple, the, the sky is blue, you may not be able to easily find that in published sources. Wikipedia as a secondary source and encyclopedia uh, does what traditional encyclopedias do and provides that general knowledge and may be used the way any other encyclopedia would be. And it can give a good broad picture as something that synthesizes several sources. Any one source may not capture the whole idea, but the Wikipedia article which synthesizes several sources may give a more accurate idea. This is particularly important when you're looking for something that is customary or generally accepted or you want to see the breadth of a term. So, just reliability. Wikipedia has huge honking disclaimers. If you look at the content disclaimers section, it will say you use it at your own risk. 
you shouldn't necessarily trust it. Relying on it may be dangerous to you. There are more little pastel boxes on individual articles in Wikipedia than there are in the biggest birthday party. If you look at it, you think, maybe I shouldn't trust this. It's subject to change, which is OK for some purposes, relating to things that may change quickly, but not for others when you're looking at a very particular definition at one point in time to support a point you want to make. There are some, ways, there are some times that this is OK when you're looking for just general background notice. But when the court is taking a notice of a particular fact, recognizing something that exists in the real world that people are relying on to make the decision, this is called judicial notice, and it requires reliable sources. I'm looking for a page down. Huh? Uh, so citation rules and how citations are to be used based on how you're citing them. Uh, the rules are worse than Wikipedia's. The blue book is the standard US legal citation guide. And not only does it have its own user's guide, a quick tour to the blue book, he mentions that it's now an intimidating 416 pages long. You ask, how am I ever going to learn 416 pages of citation rules? You are not. The actual rules are less than half. If, they are worse than Wikipedia's, which is really an impressive feat in itself. So there are many ways to use a source. Well, you can use it either as a seed generally for background information. You can use it as a citation of common knowledge. Or most problematically, you can use it as a citation on a disputed central point in a case. Some examples. Wikipedia has been used to inform decisions by giving brief explanations of terms such as booty music, hindsight bias, and opposite day, as well as background information. So, in these cases, uh, the exact definitions used were not important to the case. For example, a booty music was used giving color to the overall description of an environment where sexually a suggestive activity was going on. It was suggested that somebody was taking advantage of a minor. Yeah. Opposite day is also used to just to give color to a sentence. Uh, uh, quoting, opposite day notwithstanding, we are unable to conjure a scenario in which a speaker intended to convey the truth to a listener, i.e. not deceive, by stating what the speaker knew to be false. This is a joke and aside, not really an important. The case is about violations of the rules of professional ethics and nothing particularly hinges on whether you know what opposite day means or not, but it may help you. These are facts that do not directly pertain to the disputed parts of a case. For establishing facts, you're on shakier ground. Can Wikipedia give you the definition of wear and tear if you depend on it to determine whether you should buy a damage waiver or not? The case Ricker v. Home Depot cites three dictionaries for the definition of, uh, of wear and tear, but then it cites Wikipedia for supplementary explanation. Yeah. How often has Homeland Security told US citizens that they were in great danger of terrorism? In the case Bourgeois v. Peters, which is the first federal uh, court case to cite Wikipedia, it, it uses Wikipedia to support the yellow range of terrorism risk as normal. This case was notable for being one of the first cases to use Wikipedia as a source in that way. Fortunately, the actual fact of whether this was uh, customary was not disputed by the, by the plaintiff or the defendant. They accepted it. It wasn't a central point of the case. In the case, the protesters were, protesters were forced to submit to invasive searches that the plaintiffs argued violated their uh, fourth, First and Fourth Amendment rights in order to protest a military school that the searches were justified based on the ongoing state of elevated terrorism risk was the basis of the dispute. The judge cited Wikipedia to show that nothing was particularly elevated and that the searches may not have been justified. Let's see. There are a few other cases in which this has happened. In one, a trademark examiner used Wikipedia to establish that .info was really an established top-level domain. On appeal, the appeals judge took ju uh, uh, accepted that the Wikipedia citation was correct, but took judicial notice of ICANN info. Uh, 
After a judge attempted to analyze the intended tone of his statement, the Sixth Circuit even used Wikipedia to give additional information about sarcasm. <laughs> Wikipedia is pretty much a great source to learn about sarcasm. <laughs> Another trademark case, Alpha v. OAO Alpha Bank, they brought in an expert to testify on, the, on issues of Russian transliteration. The expert testimony cited Wikipedia in addition to uh, other sources, the article on Russian transliteration into English, and the opposition challenged this. But what did the judge think? The defendant moved to exclude the testimony mm -hmm that the plaintiff's expert had cited in, that included Wikipedia. The judge, at, in this case, long into a lengthy discussion about Wikipedia and its strength and strengths and weaknesses included in the opinion of the case. It cited the introduction to Wikipedia and the nature study that showed that it was just as reliable as many other sources. It noted that counsel had not actually challenged any of the facts the citation was used to support and concluded that its use was appropriate. It was challenged on the basis that expert testimony must be both relevant and reliable. It was using Wikipedia automatically make it unreliable? This judge did not think so. But one of the most notable cases that brought it back into the public eye was Badassa v. Mukasey. Uh, this case <coughs> was about an Ethiopian seeking asylum trying to enter the United States. She entered using a fraudulent Italian passport and was denied entry. Uh, the Board of Immigration Appeals first dismissed her case, saying that she had not established her identity, so she produced, uh, produced another document, and the case was reopened. And I'm going to uh, botch the uh, pronunciation, uh, laissez passer. Uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security submitted documents saying what it was, including a Wikipedia article that said what it was. The immigration judge reopened the case and said it didn't change the decision, and the Board of Immigration Appeals agreed. The Board of Immigration Appeals stated that it didn't condone or encourage the use of resources such as Wikipedia in reaching such pivotal decisions, and commented that the immigration judge's decision may have appeared more solid had Wikipedia not been referenced, but they declined to find that the case had been prejudiced. However, the Eighth Circuit disagreed. They said that this was not sufficient for a decision and may have pre prejudiced the case. The appeals court ultimately remanded the decision to a lower court to try it again without the uh, Wikipedia evidence. So this was a big hit in the public media. It was cited by many news sources, including Wired. It's one of the first times that an, uh, an immigration case appeared in Wired, but not in its usual subject matter. Uh, so there are widespread effects uh, from citing Wikipedia in court uh, decisions. There's over 500 citations in federal and state cases. Most of them are just on background knowledge and not very interesting. But problems may arise when they're used for more pivotal questions. There's been just one, uh, one particularly noted case since uh, the Badassa case rejected the Wikipedia citation. And, uh, in that case, Wikipedia was cited as the date of sale of a company in Palisades v. Grobard. Right to, rights to collect damages in the case was based on the date. Uh, with using the Wikipedia evidence, damages were able to be collected, but the court demanded that Wikipedia evidence be purged as it was not reliable and did not meet the burden of proof. The problems of citing Wikipedia in a legal context are similar to other contexts, but there are more consequences to bad decisions. When people, uh, when money, lives, and freedom are on the line, Wikipedia should be used as a starting point, but not as an ending point, and should not be relied upon for disputed citations. As judges are becoming more media li literate and able to use it appropriately, citing its weaknesses as well as its strength. And I hope that as the role of Wikipedia becomes more widely known, that judges use it appropriately where it applies. Uh, and to quote a law professor, Eugene Volokh, I suspect the main source of error in court opinions is, isn't relying on simply mistaken information, but rather relying on one source that says one thing, when a dozen, dozen other more reliable sources that the court hasn't found say the opposite and more persuasively. Like any source, Wikipedia should be used responsibly so that 
so that, uh, so that justice is done and it does not reflect badly on the courts or on Wikipedia. Thank you. My question is, your presentation was about those judicial opinions which um, use Wikipedia and mention the usage. Yeah. Um, so there is a potential for usage without the indication, without giving proper citation at all, or, um, or cases where judges um, come to primary sources by the use of Wikipedia, uh, which in the last case would be um, a usage I would uh, prefer over many other usages of Wikipedia directly. Um, are you aware of any kind of research um, being done to, to see if this is a tip of an iceberg um, situation uh, where there are 500 citations of Wikipedia directly and 5,000 usages of Wikipedia um, by other means um, with maybe a even more profound, more, more direct, or more um, larger impact on, on how um, the judicial system um, works and comes to conclusions. I don't know of any research being done, largely just because it's very hard to find out if people have used it when they haven't actually cited it. So I've, I've seen research trying to track how people are using it, uh, but I have not seen research uh, with people using it and not saying they're using it. Though I suspect it's like many other places that people are using it, and when they're using it appropriately, they, they cite the, the source that Wikipedia points to and not Wikipedia itself, and I wish I could find out. So. Questions? Has there any case, is there any case so far in which um, a court decision cited Wikipedia and then Wikipedia said that court decision thereby creating a circular reference? <laughs> Not that I know of and have found. <laughs> but <coughs> if you find one, you could make a Wikipedia article about it and then the universe might implode. <laughs> We know that uh, currently large corporations all over the world use, for example, social media to try and change public opinions about some subjects. So theoretically, and I'm wondering whether there's already evidence for such practical cases, in really large mega cases like the tobacco lawsuits or patent lawsuits, one could envision uh, many new entries to Wikipedia uh, which are being pushed or promoted by a corporation to change the general view about some subject. Has there any, so far, has there been any evidence of any attempt by uh, legal parties to change Wikipedia in order to affect what people might read and think about a case? Yeah. I don't know of any evidence so far, but I think that it's definitely a risk. I think if you're doing it well, you won't be caught as doing exactly. it. Exactly. Just be uh, indistinguishable from any other edits. So. Uh, I think that this is definitely a risk. I think that if you're to use Wikipedia appropriately, you should use it in a manner such that that won't matter, such as citing it only for facts that you can verify from other sources. And I hope that people will use it responsibly in that way. Getting back to the last point, if you look at the um, talk page of Murder of Mer Mer Meredith Kircher, um, draw your own conclusions. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't catch your question. The, going back to that last point, the, if you look at the talk page of Murder of Meredith Kircher, you draw your own conclusions. Mm. I think everybody with laptops in the room should go in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions? Okay. Hi. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, judges were refusing to look at expert evidence at all. And then there's a trajectory in which they get more and more used to it until they find it troublesome not to have expert evidence in topics they don't know anything about. Would you say that that's a, a natural trajectory forward? So if judges can be educated to use evidence and then they can be educated to use good evidence, if they can be educated to use Wikipedia correctly in every case? I, th I think so and I would hope so. I think that as Wikipedia becomes more accepted in scholarship, for example, and the rules for using it responsibly in scholarship become more well known, uh, similar rules will become more well known in legal scholarship. Certainly it's uh, becoming more and more impossible for a judge to be a generalist and to know enough about everything to, 
know where the primary sources are, to know where the, what the best thing is to cite, and they're going to have to use Wikipedia or similar resources as starting points. So I think if you're using it as a, an explanation is where you're getting general knowledge from in the future, as long as you're using it only for that sort of point, I think it may become more acceptable. A uh, question. As a follow-up on what the gentleman here said about uh, corporate use, because uh, as stated, there are certain sites and pages have golden locks because it's so disputed. So uh, my question is, because already today we can see there's a very big difference between the amount of advertising or corporate power behind, say, McDonald's versus fruit and vegetable uh, lobbying bodies and so on, and money and these things definitely put forth. So if Wikipedia does become such a I guess a battleground for public opinion, and some have more resources than others. Could you foresee a golden lock situation, or what do you think would happen to sort of keep a lot of facts and citations and force being brought from one side that has more resources versus the other? I think that's just such a perennial problem. Uh, uh, a lot of the, a lot of things that actually go to court go to court because the parties are fairly evenly matched. Uh, things that happen with one case, uh, the one party that has a great imbalance of power against another, often those don't even make it to court. Uh, the, the ones that do often have an even match. But otherwise, I don't have a good solution other than the general editing process. How do we how do we combat that in general? Because it's not just for justice that we care about that; it's for the integrity of the information in Wikipedia. But uh, solving that general problem will do it, but I don't have an immediate solution. Oh, there goes my laptop. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have two questions. I'm studying, I studied law in here in the university. First of all, I wanted to know whether the appeal court that said something about the fact that uh, the lower court used Wikipedia, and did he mention it or criti criticize the, the judge for using it? Yeah. The other thing is, whether we, we are talking about judges, but whether do you think juries, jury uh, got a different decision maybe because it's based his decisions on Wikipedia? Yeah, so for the second one, the, the juries aren't going to see that that Wikipedia was used in decision. Uh, the decisions are made after the jury's part is all over. Uh, for the first part, there are the, some of the cases that I cited, in fact, the appeals court did criticize the lower court for using Wikipedia, or at least for the way in which they used it saying that while the facts may have been correct, the process was incorrect, and you can't do it that way, or nobody will trust the decision, you can't rely on them. So this certainly has happened. Thank you. And thank you all the speakers, and thank you all who came to this session. Now you can enjoy uh, join lunch. Uh, have a nice break. <laughs>